The Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Persian Empire had been enemies for some time. Not only were they the two biggest factions in their region, but they also clashed culturally with their religions, diplomatic approach, and their heritage differing greatly. These two nations were at war for centuries, so it poses the question, were they natural rivals and bound to fight to the death, or were they simply neighbouring factions that needed the spoils of war? Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of the AIQ podcast. My name is Alexander Goodman and today we are talking about the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Persians. Were they natural rivals? We have a very special guest today called Sean Strong. He's a UWTSD graduate and a Oxford University graduate. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you and thank you very much for having me on uh, the podcast today. Uh, My name's Sean. Um, and I did my BA at UWTSD Lambda in Ancient and Medieval History. Uh, I then went on to do a MST in Medieval History at the University of Oxford, Um, and I focus on Byzantine history from the 4th all the way up until the 12th century uh, AD. So on this episode, we're now exploring the late antique period of history. Uh, It's something we haven't really touched upon on this podcast yet, so it's going to be quite interesting to delve into this. So we're looking at the Byzantine Empire, which is actually still the Roman Empire, but it's got a different name. This is so that um, historians could have a better distinction between the two states when referring to it in history and being uh, academic around the subject. So for any of you at home who don't know what the Byzantine Empire was or the Sassanid Persian Empire, we can have a brief explanation about what they were, how they worked and and so forth. So the Byzantine Empire is also referred to as the Eastern Roman Empire. It's important to say now that the Roman Empire technically never stopped and the Byzantine Empire never begun. It's the same thing, it just evolved and historians have used the name Byzantine Empire just to make it easier to clarify Uh, what they're talking about in their scholarship uh, studies and in the academic world. So, let's get into it. In 324 AD, the Emperor Constantine I, to commemorate his victory over Licinius, decided to begin construction on the city of Byzantium, uh, which was a former Greek polis on the uh, Bosporan Strait, which is modern-day Turkey. Um, This city is nowadays called Istanbul. So in 330 AD, the city was officially named as Constantinople and became the eastern capital of the Roman Empire, alongside uh, the western, which was Rome. This coupled with the separation of the empire into the western and eastern administrative blocks under Diocletian meant that when Emperor Theodosius I died in 395 AD, it made sense to him to split the empire between his two sons. Yes, so the western empire gets given to Honorius and the eastern empire gets given to um, Arcadius and the two brothers uh, ruled in each empire. However, due to their age, they were... um, given a a group of uh, diplomats and individuals to help guide them uh, run the empire. (laughs) So yeah, as Sean just said, um, the empire was split into two until the Western Roman Empire fell to the defeat of a guy called Oda Aka, who was a leader of a group of Germanic barbarians. And then at this point, the Eastern Roman Empire, which is the Byzantine Empire, was the only one left. So it took full control, basically, and claimed to be in the Roman Empire. And this was the case until 1453, where Constantinople fell um, to the Ottoman Turks, which ended the Byzantine Empire as we know it. So, um, Sean, can you explain a bit like how the Byzantine Empire worked? Because we know how Rome worked, and if you don't know, you can watch our previous episode on the fall of the Roman Republic, and it may give you a bit of understanding there. But, um, yeah, how does this work? Is it similar to Rome, or is it a bit different? Because it is the same, but it's also different. Yeah, no, definitely. Um... So the, the main institutions and um, way of uh, influence and, and exerting power in the Byzantine Empire remained pretty much the same uh, throughout its existence mm-hmm. um, when compared to Imperial Rome. Uh, the main power lay with the emperor at mm-hmm. the top of the hi- hierarchy, um, and then you had sort of the senate below it, um, although in the Byzantine uh, state it didn't have as much power and influence as you would think it did when you look back at the Roman Republic and Roman Empire. Um, so it, it sort of lacks that real power, but where that power then lay was with the people. The people um, is very reminiscent of sort of the Alexandrian mob in classical times. Okay. Um, and they were set into the main two groups, was the Blues and the Greens. 
and it was these racing factions that that determined what the Senate brought up in um, in sort of law and agenda for their meetings, and then that was posed to the emperor. So it's much more sort of the emperors at the top, the people at the bottom, with the racing factions um, sort of explicitly saying what they want. Um, although this was to an extent some extremism, but that is the basis of of sort of how politics got into mm. play and how the Byzantine state, it was very much the emperor made the decisions mm. and the citizens wanted to know what what they were able to achieve. Oh, wow, because that's, that's actually quite interesting. So to do a little comparison, I would say, to maybe some people uh, who would like it, because I think it's quite a cool comparison, is you could say these two racing states were a bit like when you had Caesar and Pompey, and Caesar had his faction in the Senate mm -hmm. supporting him, and you had Pompey with his side. So you have the Senate where it's uh, it's not as powerful as like the Roman one was, it seems, but you have this sort of uh, the greens and the blues coming up, these racing factions, and really actually becoming the middle ground. Well, that's quite interesting. I haven't seen a dynamic like that before. Yeah, it almost becomes the Senate as their staging ground. Mm -hmm. um, and, and quite often the, the power of these two uh, racing factions is determined by which supporter the emperor follows. So you have different emperors following different racing factions. Yeah. Um, so, for example, Justinian, he follows, followed a particular racing faction, and then that meant that that faction had much more power. Yeah. So the other one was jealous. And this was a sort of a combination of, of the, the sort of famous event of the Nika riots in Constantinople. Mm. So it's all how this sort of the bottom then becomes the more powerful and the emperor has to uh, react to the state itself. More so Constantinople, because Constantinople is the main ground of these factions. But the institution very much remains the same. And then the parties had different factions, which then related to the Senate. And then the emperor then generally decided which faction he would follow, and then that determines which which racing faction would get the most power within the within the populace of Constantinople. Mm. Well, that's actually a really interesting dynamic. But I presume the Sassanids are a bit different. So let's have a brief overview of the Sassanids right now, and really talk about how they came to being and then how they work. So, um, what do you know about the Sassanids? So in two hundred eight, there was an individual called Ardishire the first, and he managed to win a succession crisis um, between him and his brothers um, within his court, and he declared himself ruler over the region of southwestern uh, Iran, known today as Fars. Um, and this came to the attention of the Parthian king, and he was very worried about this uh, situation, you know, feeling that his power might be um, waning. So the Parthian king was uh, named Artabanus, and he was the fifth of his name, and he sent a general out to deal with this threat. However, unfortunately, it failed. Mm. So he took matters into his own hands um, and unfortunately met his uh, death on the battlefield and didn't manage to quell the rebellion. So following this defeat, Ardashir um, decided to monopolise on the, his victories and his situation and he took the initiative and began to uh, invade the western parts of the Parthian Empire, mm -hmm. eventually resulting um, into him gaining victories and small uh, road steps into the empire. Mm. And the Parthian, Emperor as a ha Parthian Empire as a whole couldn't put up much of a defence due to their fracturing with internal um, yeah. rivalries, yeah. Um, which we see throughout history many a times. <laughs> After many years of war, um, in the year 224 AD, he finally got to the place where he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, he took the title of Shah and Shah, which is King of Kings, which to an extent is the equivalent of uh, the title Emperor for Roman and the Byzantine state. Um, and it's the, the, the title Shah and Shah is, a, is an ancient title that was sort of re, revi had a revival under the Sasanians. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of harking back to their lineage and their ancient roots. Um, and then over time, he just consolidated the rest of the Parthian Empire's uh, territories, gaining victory after victory. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, he started the dynasty of the Sassanids um, and established this new empire, um, which we'll be discussing in this podcast. So, yeah, as we can see, then, the, um, the Sassanid Persians really came to a, a, a beginning through the fall of the Parthian Empire. So um, that has quite big overtones, actually, especially when you look at how the, uh, the Sassanid Persians worked. So it's clear that they actually copied the basic system of the court system and constitution of 
the Achaemenid Persian Empires, which was around during the uh, Peloponnesian Wars, as well as the Persian Wars, which we've already covered on another podcast. So the administration of territory, like under the Achaemenid Persians and the Parthians, was largely delegated to various officials uh, in the Sassanid Persians. And the power in the country was largely being held amongst the warrior and the priest classes in society. And in their society, they had four different classes. Do you know what these classes were? Yes, yeah, so um, at, at sort of the top level, the most important, you had the warrior class, uh, which uh, contained the royal family and the higher nobility. Mm-hmm. And then you had the priesthood uh, or the priest class, which, um, cons- which involved the religious um, individuals within the state. Mm-hmm. And then you had the farmers, which was a, a, a lower class, but still a very important class. And then finally you had the artisans, mm. um, and this sort of made up the bulk of the class system of the Sassanid, yeah. Sassanid Empire. Um, but of course you had a lot of the upper population which don't fall into these classes but fall into another class, but they're not too notable within the oh, Sassanid yeah. constitutional state. Okay, yeah. So it's quite clear actually the Sassanids and the Byzantines had a very different structures of how they worked as a society. You know, this yeah. class system and then you have the old Roman system of like the Senate and the people and an emperor. So as we know, the, uh, the Roman Empire and the uh, Parthian Empire, before the Sassanids came around, before the Byzantine Empire came around, were quite um, a warlike people, and they would fight a lot on their eastern frontier. And I presume the Sa- it's quite similar with the Sassanid Persians and the Byzantine Empire, because the Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire, and they may have continued this fort. Yes, yeah, so these two states, the Byzantine and Sassanid uh, empires, both continued the tradition of warfare along the eastern frontier, like their predecessors. And historians have treated them as, as have being major rivals against one another. Um, and this was very much the case until the collapse of the Sassanid Empire in 651 to the um, Rashidan Caliphate, um, which expelled the sort of very much changing dynamic of the, the mid 7th century. So now we're all caught up to speed uh, on the two empires and how they would uh, interact and obviously they were at war a lot like their predecessors were. Uh, we're going to now look at this as a, a bigger picture in this podcast and we're going to really look at that question, were they natural rivals? So yeah, we, we, we know that they were at war quite a lot and there was a lot of conflict. So um, do we actually know who was a real threat? And so by that, um, let's have a look at their foreign policy. Do we actually see if there really was an aggressor out of the two? Yes, yeah, so it, it's quite an interesting dynamic between the two because um, they're, they're fairly similar at, this, at the base level, but when you look at the actual policy itself and the treaties that come out of this conflict, mm. it then adds a lot of depth to uh, what, what we understand about them. Uh, for example, the Romans... Um, as previously in the Republican and, and Imperial times, um, had a had a theory and concept of defensive imperialism. Mm. You know, defending they were the ones having defensive wars, having to compete, but yet again expand. Yeah. Um, and to an extent, we can see this with with this war that you know the Byzantines did want to sort of continue the conflict. You know, get ahead in in in, in the relationship between the two states. Mm. But at this time, you know, the Sassanid Empire was very much a big foe for them. It was sort of almost a natural stopping point, and it was a stalemate between the two. Mm. And and what we can see from the Sassanid side, um, with their foreign policy, is that they were the ones dominating it. You know, mm. they were they were the ones um, putting all putting all the the terms down to the Romans. So we can see this sort of aggressive nature. Mm. in diplomacy from the Sassanids, Mm. um, sort of putting the Romans to shame in essence, um, sort Mm. of putting them down to size. And this can also be seen through um, the initiations of of the wars between the two two empires, in which the Sassanids are most almost um, the ones initiating the conflict. Mm. The Byzantines, again, whether it's um, due to internal problems or choice, again this defensive imperialism are the ones reacting to the Sassanid threat the Sassanid is always the one initiating the war um, invading uh, Roman territory raiding um, various parts of the eastern frontier so we can sort of see this um, dominating effect that Sassanids are are sort of prodding and poking the Roman Mm. Empire in their eastern provinces Mm -hmm. 
and then following that up they're sort of initiating it and then once it's sort of got down to the the, the bare bones in the treaties that are then signed afterwards they're again they're dominating you mm. know you can see that the romans aren't their imperial normal selves of the mm. ones being sort of so yeah the, the assassin is very much maybe not the aggressors in terms of diplomacy, but the aggressors are in terms of initiating the battles, but they're dominant in diplomacy. And this is where their real strength comes in, mm. in, in looking at the Roman and Persian relations. Mm. Well, that's really interesting, because I'm just, um, just wondering then, actually, like if the Persians were the aggressors normally and they were the ones really attacking the frontier, why did the frontier never really move? Like They do get land and the Byzantine, Byzantines get land. and They do change it, uh, change, change the frontier at points, but it doesn't really move much. So I was wondering, is there actually then some external problems going on like that maybe prevent the Sassanids from, uh, from gaining in this war? Because if they are so dominant and they are the aggressor, why are they not uh, cleaning through the Byzantine land? So do you know yeah. of any like external threat that may have contributed? Yes, yeah, so b- b- both empires had external threats other than each other. Um, and, and these external threats um, were rated from mere annoyances to, to severe threats. Mm. Um, for the Byzantines in, in particular, during the 4th century, they obviously had the, the influx of the Germanic migrating tribes, such as Goths, the Vandals, yeah. and so so that was a major problem, more so for the Western Empire, but the East still had to mm. to cope with, in particular, the Ostrogoths through yeah. the settling um, on, along the Danube um, mm. part of the territory. Well, and it was these tribes that actually made Rome fall in the end, wasn't it? The Western Roman Empire. So yeah. they must have been a real big problem for the Eastern, I presume, as well, if they can actually destroy the whole of the the, the Western Roman Empire. Yeah. So. Um, very much a problem that the the only difference between the western and eastern roman empire is how they decided to deal with it mm. so the western empire decided to deal with it through perhaps a bit more military uh, focused approach they were, mm. they didn't want to lose territory they were the ones fighting to 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 remain the power in the west yeah whereas the east had a much smaller frontier that these barbarians were coming uh, down into and we see in the 4th century the, the settling of the Ostrogoths on Roman territory to sort of appease their needs. Um, and also later in the 5th century, the integration of the Ostrogoths into the Roman sort of government. So it's this two sort of different mindsets. Although the Western um, Roman Empire did integrate certain barbarian um, individuals into status, the East were very much more attuned to the necessity of maintaining this status quo but through a bit more diplomatic means. So they mm. were, especially with the Huns, you know, they, they sort of dealt with the normal barbarian tribes through uh, diplomacy, but the Huns were primarily um, through a tribute and payment. So mm. it was all about these different methods that both empires uh, mm. had at their disposal yeah. and which one was sort of the most successful in, in maintaining the stability of, of the two empires, really. Mm. But also in the um, 6th century, uh, I know that the Byzantine Empire had that... Uh, Balkan frontier, and I know there was a lot of tribes there, so were they a problem at any point? Yeah, uh, the Balkan frontier remained a very vital frontier for the Byzantines, Mm. um, with varying uh, levels of uh, severity, but in the 6th century you have uh, the Gepid Kingdom, which is very much a a major player um, along along the northern periphery of the Byzantine Empire, and what the Byzantines did was they invited a a Turkic um, tribe called the Avars, Okay. And they sort of brought them down in order to sort of manipulate them in order to take on the Gepid threat. Oh, right. So it was almost this sort of Byzantine manipulation of diplomacy um, and sort of divide and conquer tactics that mm. we see here. So it was very much the Gepid kingdom um, was faced against the Lombards mm. and the Vars. And what happened was throughout the centuries, um, the Gepids were defeated and the Lombards eventually went down to Italy. Mm. Um, so they, they sort of left the, the the Balkan frontier, but what was left was the Avar uh, Kaganate. Mm. Yeah. And this was very much a problem for um, the Byzantines. Um, a constant war, um, and they even, uh, in the late 6th century, they decided to, um, through coincidence or pure brilliant planning, uh, we, we, are, we don't know particularly, uh, but they managed to, um, in the 6th and 7th century, um, siege Constantinople. 
uh, with the assistance of the Persians. We can see this uh, Western Eastern uh, threat come to real prominence, um, especially in the 7th century, there was uh, the Avar and Persian siege of Constantinople, which lasted a, a relatively long time. Mm. Um, but throughout much of the 6th century, the Avars were a problem, and the different emperors had to have different means and methods of dealing with them, yeah. alongside dealing with, obviously, mm. the Sassanid Persians, which were sort of the major threat on the east. Yeah. Well, I mean, so. if they can uh, siege Constantinople, they must be a real threat. Um, yeah, so that really would put Byzantium in a uh, tough spot, wasn't it? You've got the massive uh, Sassanid Empire to your east. You've got these um, Vars up to the north. And, you know, both of them, um, you know, are just as dangerous as each other. Wow, they were in a really, really problematic point there. So um, that's, that's really interesting from the Byzantine point of view. But... Um, why then would the Sassanids not take advantage of this? Did they have problems? Yes, yeah, so the, the Sassanids very much as the Romans had, obviously um, the Sassanid Empire was very large um, and stretched a considerable amount, sort of reminiscing back to the empire of Alexander the Great, that, um, just without the um, western territory of like Asia Minor, Syria, mm. Egypt, um, but all the, the sort of west, the eastern um, territory of Alexander the Great was basically the Sassanid mm. Empire. Mm. Well, apart from the Indus Valley, but yeah, all the way up to yeah. basically India. Quite a yeah. large territory they held, held um, at this point. So they, again, like the Byzantines, they had multiple frontiers that they had to defend against. Mm. Um, and they're, they're, although there was um, various nomadic tribes uh, sort of piercing through the territory at various stages for the Sassanid Persians, it was one group um, in particular that was a sort of a thorn in their side. Um, and these were the Tephalites, mm. or... Um, as they might be more commonly known, the White Huns. Oh, God. And these were a, um, a, a Hunnic people um, that came down probably from Mongolia, similar to uh, the Huns of Attila. Um, however, they didn't go as far west, so they sort of wanted to keep their um, area of occupation, raiding and invasion to, towards the east. Mm. Um, so you can sort of see swathes of land um, in the eastern territory of the Sassanid Empire falling and then being reclaimed by these two nations. Okay. And that, that was a real threat for the, uh, for the Sassanids. Mm. Um, and this was throughout the 4th to 7th century as well, the empire was at its, you know, prominence. And, mm. and um, it was perhaps the singly most important enemy for the Sassanids. Oh, right. Um, the, the, these heptaphylites, you know, these were the, the fall in their side, the the sort of status quo was changing in the East mm. and the Sassanids wanted to make sure that their empire was still intact at the end. So it was these Huns mm. um, that were sort of making the East pressured alongside the Romans starting to pressure yeah. the West. So it was, they didn't want to feel enclosed um, and they, they believed that both sides were worth fighting for, but... Um, yeah. Well, you can really yeah. see then actually like a picture developing of that assassinate per well, from the assassinate person Persian point of view. Your main threat are these um, Hunnic people from the north of your territory, and then you've just got this little squabbling Byzantium Empire tipping you, poking at you as well. So, yeah, wow, well, they're they're also in a tough point. You've got Byzantium got their their north and their east are problems, and it's the same for the Sassanids. But instead, it's their north and their west. So they're they're both in a real problematic point, it seems. Yeah, no, definitely, and that's not to take away from you know the, these were the the main rivals of uh, Byzantium and the Sassanid Empire. This is, you know, not to take away from the the constant conflict you know with Belisarius in 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 the west. Yeah. So you still had the Vandals, the Goths, and even in North Africa you had um, the Berber tribes sort mm. of attacking North Africa and raiding that territory. Mm. And then in the Sassanids you also had from the south the Arabs. Um, mm. So it, it it was you know. The, the Heptephalites and the Avars were the most prominent external threats to, to both states. Um, mm. But you did have a multitude of different nomadic and um, settled peoples that were sort of chipping away at both empires, very much reminiscent of the Western Roman Empire getting sort of chipped away bit by bit, lands and territory um, in, in the third and fourth centuries. Mm. So it's pretty clear, actually, that they did have a lot of external threats, and that was a big problem when we think about their frontier and what they could 
put to defend it and become the aggressor on it. But it does make me wonder, was there any internal threats? Because I do know that with the Byzantine Empire, you did have a lot of conflict and um, division between monarchs and leading generals and statesmen, such as the division between Justinian and Belisarius, where uh, uh, Belisarius seemingly became too powerful and then Justinian tried to wipe him off that. Well, is there many of that in, in these two empires? Yeah, no, that's a great example of the division between emperor and sort of leading army officials. Um, and, and this sort of really came to fruition with uh, Belisarius' reconquest of, of the Western territories. Um, and, this, and this sort of relationship between emperor and, and army official is sort of can be seen throughout the empire, you know, not just in the Roman and Persian conflict. It's, it's a continuous uh, internal strife. Um, but in particular to sort of the Persian and Roman conflict, you have a series of internal struggles towards the end of the 6th century and early 7th century in terms of um, usurpation and succession crisis. And um, this was very much down to um, individual policy. And this caused much disruption to, to, either, to both frontiers, east and, and, and the northern frontier on the Balkans. And in particular, this was the case for the Emperor um, Phocas and the Emperor Maurice. Mm. So um, what we have is Maurice sort of consolidated the Persian um, threat um, quite early on in his uh, uh, rulership. And what we see is then his focus turning to the Balkan, another obviously, like we said, prominent threat for the, for the Byzantines. Um, but then what we see is this, this army official, um, low-ranking army official focus, deciding to revolt against the emperor. And this very much crumbles the, the military effectiveness and success along the Balkan frontier. And um, this causes the whole empire to uh, disintegrate in terms of internal sort of politics and, and its ability to put up a strong defense against uh, the Avars and the Persians. So what happens is Phocas um, takes the throne, kills Maurice, and due to um, the treaty that Maurice signed with the, the Persian king, it meant that Persia then got involved in Byzantine affairs. Mm. So it's this, this dynamic of internal, um, external um, policy of Maurice had an, then an impact in the context of, of Phocas. Mm. So it, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, thing to look at in terms of Persia has finally sort of got its way in mm. to, to sort of seeing the seeds of sort of decline in the, in the Byzantine state. Mm. Thankfully, another usurpation occurs. Again, uh, this is at a time when the, the Persian War is now on, on its last, sort of last leg, but um, in which we see Heraclius uh, usurp Phocas. And this was very much as a result of the, the decline in, in the Byzantine Empire's um, mm. stability. Um, but it's, it's just, overall, when you're looking at this sort of dynamic, you've had two usurpations within the, the space of 20 to 30 years. Mm. And it's all because of this internal fracture, which then impacts the empire's external yeah. standings and power. Because the Sassanid Persians very much well know that when Phocas came to the throne, they were weakened. You know, Maurice was a very capable, he was a military commander before he became emperor. And the Persians see this as, an, as a weakness. They know the internal, you know, structure of the Byzantines because they've been at their court through embassies and envoys. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they sort of take advantage of this. So it's very much, you can see this certain event, which was internal, yeah, had major ramifications for its mm. eastern frontier. Oh, it's devastating, isn't it? I mean, you know, losing one emperor to then get another one, and then them be that one being lost as well, while you've got the Persians pushing on the frontier at the same time and being involved in Byzantine politics. That's, oh, I would imagine that's very crippling for a state to go through. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can really understand why um, the... Uh, the, the, the decline of this uh, war started to happen because Byzantium was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Yeah. You know, but as we can see, this also happened with the um, Sassanid Persians because they had their own problems, didn't they? Um, I know, as we mentioned earlier, you had the two highest uh, classes in them, which is the warrior class and the priesthood class. And I imagine if they are the most powerful, they're probably going to have some internal problems with that, as most states probably would if you've got two powerful points like the Byzantium you know you had the two racing uh, places they would fight for that power I, I assume it'd be the same in this one 
Yes, no, definitely. And um, sort of the warrior class, as we said previously, is, is the nobility, the royal's family. So that's very much um, sort, of a, a, sort of a support group of the Shah and Shah, the King mm. of Kings. And then you have the priesthood, which is very much um, non-independent from the state because it's a part of this, the social structure, but it's very much um, independent in thought. Mm. As, as we see through, you know, classical, imperial, and then on into medieval times, religion is very important. Yeah. And no empire um, can sort of dictate religious policy without having ramifications. No, because religion is part of everyday life. Everyone yeah. has something to do with religion. And so if you try and uh, take that away, there will be a lot of problems. And uh, if it's a state doing it to the people, you can imagine the uh, up- uproar that would happen. So, yeah, it's yeah. quite a, the religion's quite a um, fragile thing at this point. Yeah, no, definitely. And again, this is sort of, we can sort of see the mirror dynamics, you know, Justinian in the 6th century sent missionaries to the Sassanid Empire. And this sort of brought an ever-evolving sort of disruption between the warrior and priesthood classes because you had the sort of, although they were there in the first place, sort of the the numbers of these, of, of the different religious groups such as the Jews and the Christians within the Sassanid state sort of grew and it, it sort of changed the dynamic and the priesthood very much Zoroastrian and, and sort of firm in their beliefs didn't want this to sort of take away from their standing within in the internal structure of the, of the empire so it was very much not only sort of religious power play but it was also this, the priesthood wanting to not let the warrior class or um, the Shah and Shah take sort of too much uh, manipulation over the state. So yes, yeah, so the priesthood was very much a checking system against the Shah and Shah and the warrior class as, as a collective um, two elements of the Sassanid state. And, th- and this led to um, problems when uh, succession came into account. You know, the, the individual of the Shah and Shah had to have sort of a reputation. He wasn't sort of um, position, given the position of power due to his sort of divine right or, or given to him by God in which the Byzantines believed, he had to have um, sort of a, a validation by the state in order to be um, um, put forward as king. And, and, and this, the Shah and Shah could be elected through any number of the royal families. Mm. So there were several royal families. Um, and, and it was who, who was the best candidate. Mm. Um, so th- this led to much sort of disruption um, within the warrior class because obviously they were t- deciding who was going to be the next um, the king but also the priesthood wanted to make sure that their, their voices was heard mm-hmm. and in particular if there was a certain individual that the populace didn't want because he was you know a, a tyrant or sort of wanted to go to war with everyone mm-hmm. you know then those voices to be heard you know from the farm and artisan uh, classes as well so yeah, the ones that would feel the effects from the wars I yeah presume, yeah so it, it, it's, it's very much internal fracturing could quite easily disrupt the Sassanid stability mm. very much um the same with the byzantine state both had external and internal problems that could affect their yeah capability along their their border with each other. Mm. Well, that really does make me wonder then. So, if both of these um, states have really problematic external problems and really devastating internal problems, well, why are they fighting each other at all? Would they not be wanting to consolidate themselves and focus on the other points? So that really poses the question to me: that were they actually just fighting because they were the two largest powers in the region? So you've got, for instance, like Rome and Carthage. They sort of fight and have a war because it's their natural progression of those two empires. They had to clash to be able to expand their influence, and the other one wouldn't let the other one do it. Could it be the same case with these two, and it, it just naturally would have occurred? Or, you know, is there something a bit different? And uh, I know you've done a, um, a conference paper on, the, on this with, in conjunction with Oxford University, and you sort of talked about an arms race. So um, I think that would be really interesting to talk about because we can see about the growth of the uh, military presences on the border and uh, and so for instance the army size is there and maybe that will give us an insight as to uh, what these two people actually thought about each other and on that frontier what their actions said because sometimes actions can speak louder than words yeah no definitely yes yeah, so army sizes in in both empires can sort of say a real lot about how they uh, perceived each other um so if we go with rome first mm-hmm. um so 
throughout the 4th century, the, the eastern frontier was very heavily fortified in terms of field armies, um, garrison troops, which were known as limitane, mm. um, and just the general fortification lines, um, w- which can be seen on, you know, on a map. The, the, the frontier was very fortified with either fortresses or fortified cities. Um, and there's a theory that the Romans used this idea of uh, defence in depth, which is that the, 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 the Roman Empire had these uh, strategic fortresses along uh, the eastern frontier, mm. and they're interconnected by uh, a multitude of um, roads, mm-hmm. which meant that even though garrison troops were sort of in the high numbers, yeah. um, it allowed for field armies to sort of respond to invasion forces or large raiding forces very quickly. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of the Romans trying to deal with um, the Sassanid threat through mobility and defence rather than sort of offensive warfare in essence. Okay. So it's to trap them very... like So if the Persians invaded, it would um, the Byz- Byzantines would have the ability to be able to trap them very quickly and not go into the land very far because of this road system they had with all their different forts. Yeah, so to be fair, the road system works both ways. The Sassanids mm-hmm. could have used it uh, themselves, but it, it was... It, yeah, very much so. It was just to stop them sort of making real inroads um, and yeah. it was a quick response uh, to, to the threat. Um, that the Romans could give because their armies could have been um, up in the northern part, the eastern frontier, or it mm. could have been down in the south. So it mm. was very, you know, the, the empire spanned a long, a long uh, distance along the eastern frontier. So it was, it was hard for these field armies that were sort of large numbers. You know, mm. you're talking about between fifteen to twenty thousand men, sort of responding to the changes. So it was this sort of idea of strong fortified positions that could hold out or could sort of pose a threat both um, in its defence, but for, but also visually mm. to the Persians. Um, that sort of the Romans tried to, in that way, maintain their status quo. Mm. Yeah, because I presume, like, you were saying how the Persians could even use this technique for their advantage, but I presume also it, 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 they'd be hampered in a way, because if they just plough through and try and go through this system uh, as quick as they can into um, such as maybe like Asia Minor, that's the direction they want to go, um, these fortifications, if they're not dealt with in these um, sort of like fortified cities, if not dealt with, their garrisons could come up and deal with their baggage train or, mm-hmm. you know, um, make problems for the Persians. So I guess it's actually a bit of a slug war where they have to defeat one, then another, then another, and slowly make their way, buying time for, as you said, the Byzantine army to come in, sweep in, and actually challenge them. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and this is where we can sort of see... Um, throughout the, the, the later 6th century, smaller Persian invasion forces sort of attacking various points. Mm. So it sort of not only, conf- not to an extent, confuses them, but it makes the Romans really decide which threat is the most uh, prevalent. Oh, right, so they're even adapting their tactics to deal with it. Oh, that's really yeah. interesting. So, you know, towards the, the early part of the war, you know, the Romans would start to learn the routes that they would, the Persians would generally go down, mm. um, and they'd be able to move uh, effectively to deal with it to a certain extent, um, but throughout the later part, you know, it was very difficult for the Romans to respond to um, sort of the, the mobility of the Sassanid army. Mm. Um, but this is where the, sort of the Romans, to an extent, had had a bit of a bit of luck, really, because mm. um, they gained in their southern part of the frontier, which sort of encompassed Syria and um, the top part of... Um, Egypt, which connects uh, Syria to, to, to North Africa, mm. they had an ally, an Arab ally called the Ghassanids. Okay. And they performed uh, sort of like a buffer state um, between uh, the Roman uh, southern eastern frontier mm. to the Sassanid Persians. Mm. And, and this sort of allowed them to um, manoeuvre their troops a lot better. What they, what they uh, did in the, 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 the early to mid 6th century was to heavily fortify um, these southern cities and fortresses Mm. and make them a lot more defensive in their capabilities. And what they allowed the Gassans to do was occasionally occupy these. Oh, okay. Wow. So it sort of allowed the Gassans to sort of perform their duties as as sort of uh, allies and um, sort of protectors of of, of the Byzantine state. But it, um, it also meant that the Roman army sort of wasn't as stretched on the eastern frontier as, as it as it had to be yeah yeah so so that enabled um 
the, the north part of the eastern frontier, mainly sort of the opening of Mesopotamia and Anatolia mm. between the two empires, um, to have a real focal point of where the conflict was going to be between these two nations. Mm. And here we can see um, quite in, in real depth the, um, the theory of defence in depth, where you see the multiple cities. But what we can also see is um, where this is particularly where a number of the um, field armies were stationed. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously there wasn't um, loads and loads of field armies, but the particular ones that were assigned to the eastern provinces were probably and have been um, seen to be located in in this northern part of the eastern frontier. Mm. Um, well, that's that's really interesting because if we talk about this frontier as a whole, then you've got only a small section in the north part of the frontier where it's actually the Sassanids versus the uh, Byzantiums. Uh, but then in the south, as you said, you've got this buffer state. The um, the Byzan the Byzantine Empire has a uh, Arabian ally, and from my knowledge, also didn't the um, Persians have one as well? So mm. in the south, it was just they were having they were almost playing chess or puppets with these two. Um, these two Arabian people, where they were fighting each other on behalf, but then they themselves were focusing in the north, where their borders actually met. Yeah, you know, definitely. And um, the, the Persian uh, Arab ally was the Lakhmids, and, and this sort of enabled both empires, you know, in terms of manpower, resources, um, to really focus on the real critical frontier zone of the, of the northern eastern part of the frontier. And it allowed them to sort of have some sort of not relaxed uh, situation in the south, but it allowed them to sort of not focus their main forces on on those uh, locations, which meant that they had a bit more breathing space in times or in terms of responding to to the um, threats. Mm. Um, and and this power play between both uh, Rome and Persia continued throughout much of the conflict. Um, eventually, these Arab allies would sort of dwindle in their uh, influence and power, um, but they still remained a focal point of, of the Roman and Persian uh, war between each other. Mm. So. so, yeah, as, as you've been saying, it's sort of very clear that um, the Byzantine Empire was actually quite worried about this frontier. So they not only did they have actual stationed armies there and heavy garrisons, but they also had this uh, this defensive mechanism of, of the uh, fortifications so the Persians couldn't really press through the land quickly. And they also then had Arab allies helping their um, defence of the southern part of the um, the frontier. So, yeah, it's quite obvious that um, the Byzantines were quite worried about this. I wonder then, when um, when the uh, reconquest of the West happened and those uh, Germanic tribes we talked about started pushing on their empire, did, did that weaken their frontier at all? Did they have to send armies away, or were they able to deal with it? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's many scholars agree that uh, Justinian was... A great emperor, uh, emperor, he reconquered the Western territories. He reclaimed Rome. Mm. Um, however, this sort of had a very lasting effect on on the empire as a whole and for its uh, sustainability. You know, this this great feat was very um, impressive, mm. but it did weaken the empire considerably because the amount of troops that were stationed um, in the east was very much. Um, you could resemble it to a very heavily fortified frontier for the Romans. Mm. And as soon as um, Justinian becomes emperor, he then decides to, to sort of part ways um, with the eastern frontier. He, you know, he mm. sort of still keeps an eye on it, but his, his, his agenda is to the west. And due to the reserves that Anastasius um, uh, sort of uh, provided in his, his, his rulership in the early 6th century, it enabled him to, as you said, reconquer the west. Mm. And what this did is it moved manpower and resources from the eastern frontier over to the west. Well, yeah, because they had, didn't it, wasn't under Justinian, they had the etern eternal peace, which lasted about eight years, so it's not eternal at all. No. But the, <laughs> the hope of having eternal peace with the Persians. Um, and I remember in, in your paper, I believe you said something about how they proclaimed each other's brothers. Yes, yes, yeah, so it was um, sort of brothers in... Uh, possibly political sense mm -hmm. um, and possibly in um, relation to um, them seeing themselves as equals. Okay. Um, but what I sort of assumed it harked back to was this sort of the Sassanids and the Romans trying to hark back to the idea of the Western and Eastern Roman Empire. Mm. You know, these were two large empires that had power mm. um, and both had emperors 
generally when they were established, well, it, when they were established, it was two brothers. Mm. And I think it was just harking back to the, to the sort of trying to bring this, um, these two states closer together, sort mm. of bring, you know, we're not that different. You know, we do have differences, um, but we are, we are, you know, we don't want to be defeated. We don't want to be beaten. We want mm. to stay where we are. Um, to be fair, how much of this is just propaganda for both yes, sides? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, because the reason I brought it up is because cause it only lasts about eight years. I was, I was thinking that, you know, how much of this is actually true? Because in Justinian's mind, if you've got an eternal peace with your main rival and uh, then you have the whole reconquest of the uh, Western uh, Roman Empire going on, surely he would have relaxed the fortifications and the armies and garrisons present on the eastern border because in his mind, why would he need it? He has a peace, he's ha literally with his now so-called brothers. So, you know, would that have had an impact? And if it, if it did have an impact, how, how, how much of an impact was that on the relations of these two places, but also on the ability to defend the eastern frontier? Yeah. It did have a big impact um, throughout uh, pre uh, preceding this uh, eternal peace. Um, Justinian and both Anastasius, the emperor in the early 6th century, went on a, a scheme of refortifying the eastern frontier. Mm -hmm. So Anastasius had a very clear uh, vision of the eastern frontier as the most important. Um, as with Justinian, we see the West becoming a bit more increasingly in his mind. Mm. Um, but it didn't mean that Justinian didn't care about the East. Okay. You know, he still cared and he still knew that it was very valuable. Um, it's just that his attention was turned to the to the West. Okay. Um, but it, to an extent, um, the manpower was relaxed. Um, you know, there wasn't as many troops because obviously he had to stretch them across his yeah. reconquered uh, territories. Um, the assumed peace with the Persians meant that there wasn't to an extent a necessity for them to be there yeah. whereas with the West you know the Goths were still uh, you know not subdued completely you had Berber incursions in North Africa to deal with the Vandals who were also rebellions so the, the armed forces of, of the Roman Empire were to an extent needed elsewhere yeah. um, so it did have a major impact on manpower and uh, this did eventually mean that the when war was reignited between the two factions uh, under Justinian and, and Khusro, the Persian king, it, um, it meant that the Romans had to really respond really quickly. Mm. And Belisarius was called back from the west to, to focus on the east. Um, and it was, yeah, it was it impacted their quickness to respond and mm. and the manpower available to respond. You know, mm. they, they weren't in a position that they were at the start of Justinian's reign in terms of sort of possibly dominating this Persian frontier, you know, although it didn't happen, they had the resources and manpower to do so. Whereas towards the end um, of Justinian's reign, they, they really didn't have the resources. The manpower was elsewhere. The leading generals were elsewhere, you know, and it was just, mm. it was very weakened. So mm. I think the Sassanids could sort of sense that. Mm -hmm. They played on that, and then that's when they decided to to embark on a, another conflict with the Romans in, in the mid to, to late sixth century. So, yeah, as you said, um, you have, the for the Byzantines, you have this frontier that is going from different time periods being very, very defended to then um, uh, quite a considerable amount uh, leaving to then helping it with elsewhere in the empire. But obviously, that then, uh, that, that empire then shrinks back, doesn't it? Uh, and they lose a lot of the Western provinces. Um, but... Uh, a problem that uh, they face is because Justinian spent so much money reconquering this, they uh, they didn't have the funds really to put the same amount of fortifications back into this into this border. Um, so as we can see, this this border is defended highly, uh, and then also gets um, less and less as time goes on. But what's interesting is how the Persians would be defending this border because, as we mentioned earlier, they had the problem of the White Huns to their north, a very very problematic state for them who would uh, cause a lot of problems and is probably their main uh, enemy, uh, with, at least when we think about the amount of devastation and destruction they can mm. actually do. So I wonder, how much would the Persians put onto this border? Are their eyes really fixed here, or is this sort of a, a little side thing that they just need to make sure that they're winning, but they're not uh, committing too much there? Yeah, yeah so if we, if we go into the same premise of sort of looking at manpower along, along there, 
the Sassanid Persians Western frontier, um, it, it's, it'd be good to sort of introduce sort of the, the constitution of how the military was split up. Yes. Um, so the, military, the, the empire was split into um, four distinct territories, mm-hmm. and these were um, given to the command of Spahbeds. Spahbeds, okay. Spahbed, yeah. Um, each a military command, each with their own armies um, mm-hmm. that were to be utilised within each region, um, and each could behave independently from each other. Mm. So there's almost like major generals in each of these regions that can control their armies. Yeah. Cool. All to the um, all to the service of the king. You know, of if, course, the, yeah. if the king wanted to command an army, the spa bed would then come down. You know, still be yeah. in charge of, of of certain forces, but the king would normally lead the army that he wanted to lead. Mm. Um, but I presume that would make their their ability quite flexible. So if they have like three different frontiers, um, if there's a region near that frontier, that can go deal with that while another army is dealing somewhere else. So you don't have this sort of confused state where you're sending armies all over the place, but you've got a very easy uh, and uh, noticeable system where you can uh, give different armies different jobs and different roles. So one army may be defending another army may be attacking sort of like arabia the other one could be holding the northern frontier so they, they, it seems like they're quite flexible yeah i, I think that was the, the prime aim of the Sassanids. they they knew that they were not in trouble but they knew that they were in a, a strong but vulnerable position mm. um and and that's really the the main purpose of these spa beds was to to add flexibility to to the army um, so that they could respond or or even initiate um, conflict and war against their external um, uh, enemies. Yeah. So th- so this meant that um, the the spa bed that was in particularly in relation to the to the Roman frontier mm-hmm. um, was typically lightly defended. You know, there were two main strategic uh, locations uh, mm-hmm. along the frontier, which were um, Devin, what's it, which is um, near or within Armenia, because Armenia sort of expands and and retracts uh, variously uh, during this period. And then Nisibis, which um, is a a, a prominent city um, which was fought over a lot by the Romans Mm. and Persians. So these these are both cities? Both cities, um, both forward operations for the Persians. These were the two major operation centres. And these were the two main defensive uh, centres too. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of the frontier, in, when we look at sort of the geography and the makeup of it, um, was very much natural uh, uh, borders. So mm-hmm. you sort of had um, sort of the mountains, rivers. You know, that was the essence of of the Sassanids' western frontier defences. And when we compare that to to the Roman defences, or when we see these uh, th- these linking of fortress cities and and fortresses in their own right, yeah, it sort of gives a stark contrast, you know. Um, yeah, it does. <laughs> and, and you sort of think, well, what's what, what's going on? Um, and and that's when we sort of look at the other areas of the Sassanid Empire, in in, in the north to the um, west of the of the Caspian Sea, you have the Darbant Wall, mm. um, which is a string of uh, fortresses and, and, and wall complex to, to face sort of the northern uh, nomadic tribes sort of trying to pen, come into the um, Sassanid Empire, you know, Huns, Alans, you know, later, you know, um, other Turkic groups. And then to the um, east of the Caspian Sea, you have the Gorgon Wall, mm. which um, is debated to be uh, built by the Persians, but it's also debated to, to be built by Alexander the Great. Mm. Um, and it's sort of linking back to this northern frontier. So, but when you look at these complexes, these are major fortification complexes. When you look at the Gorgon Wall, if any of you know the sort of Hadrian's Wall and, and, and the Antonine Wall in, in, in the U- United Kingdom, if you add both of them in length, you get the Gorgon Wall. You know, and it's a it's a major fortification complex. Mm, that's quite a considerable wall. That's yeah. a very large wall. And and you know, I think it, it's estimated. I can't remember the exact figures, but it was between sort of thirty fortresses, mm. and this wall would sort of house between, you know, in the thousands of soldiers. Mm. So when when we compare, in particular, the Sassanid northern frontier 
mm. which was to face the Haptephalites, the Alans, you know, the other nomadic groups. Yeah. It's vastly fortified compared to their West. Mm. And what we talk, and what we can pull from this is that the northern frontier and the enemies that pose a threat there were to an extent more important or more of a of a severe threat mm. than the Romans were. You know, and just to sort of drum home the point, Ktesiphon, the Persian capital, was in the was in the west. Yeah. Right next to the not right next to, but very close to the Roman Persian frontier mm. border. Oh, well, at least you can say definitely within uh, the proximity of, if an invasion did happen from the Byzantines, they could have reached their capital. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, you must be quite. Um, bold and uh, quite optimistic about this frontier if you put your capital because let's be honest any state if your capital was besieged or even uh, even sacked you know if they actually managed to get inside that's going to have devastating uh, results throughout your land um, so that's quite interesting yeah when you think about they've they've almost put on this northern frontier they've put a big wall in and heavily fortified it almost as though they're saying right whatever's going to come this way we will stop but that doesn't really give an essence that they want to progress past that that's yeah. the border they want but on this um on this other on the uh, their western frontier the fact that they've left it all natural although that may be a very good defense anyway so they don't need to have a wall the fact they've only got really got two cities which is their base of operations on such a vast amount of land that that gives me the indication that perhaps this isn't the boundary they want and they would push past this and they would gain more and they would like to do that um, and I mean, eventually, that is what they do. They do push past this, and they do uh, really uh, take a lot of um, land that the Byzantines have. But no, that is very interesting. You can definitely see that the uh, Persian interest and their their uh, worries probably aren't on this frontier. It's more that northern northern section, and so it's it's less defended. And you know, perhaps rightfully so, because the Byzantines don't really ever seem to be a big threat to them they they are threatening sometimes and they do take land and they do get some wealth but um i can understand why they are more scared of these white huns and the uh, nomadic people um especially if if they are putting this sort of defense up there must be a reason for that yeah no definitely and it's um it's it's just exemplified with um sort of again the the assassins were the initiators of of their wars with the Romans, you know, the Romans didn't really were able to dominate policy or or the wars. It was the Sassanids, you know, it was almost like it was the Sassanids' playground. You mm. know, they wanted when they wanted to raid, they raided. If they wanted an invasion, they invaded. Mm. And generally, even if they were defeated or um, lost quite a lot of men, they'd be able to recoup due to, the, you know, their their military numbering between 300 to 310,000 soldiers yeah. throughout the whole empire. You know, they had the replenishment rate. Yeah, it's a very large, ar- there's a very large army they could field. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, they were, and in, and in, in diplomacy, they were generally getting away with getting tribute from the Romans or receiving cities or, you know, even if they lost a war, just giving a few cities back. You know, mm. it wasn't, it wasn't so consequential for the Persians to an extent that the Romans, you know, beat them occasionally. It was more, what can we get out of the Romans when we want to? Yeah, yes. <laughs> when you think about um, the frontier, as we've just mentioned, you think about fortifications and you think about the manpower they put in there. But what we've also got to remember is these armies, you know, would clash now and again. So what's quite important is to see how that changed and uh, did um, did they uh, try any different tactics on the battlefield or any f- differences to their their uh, actual units like their infantry or cavalry to try and beat the others or were they again changing for other threats and so it was um, they changed to each other j- but because of the external threats what what really happened here do you have any uh, yeah. anything in your paper that might have talked about that yeah so um, I think it would probably be best to start with the Persians because yep. um, as, as you know, various people would know the Romans are very keen to adapt to their neighbours and uh, different customs in terms of warfare. But in the fourth century, the Persians um, had a mixed arm composition. So they had uh, infantry, cavalry, um, allies, and they even have uh, the famed elephants corps. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what we see is. Um, these sort of descriptions of sort of the Persian infantry is quite surprisingly quite disciplined. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and the cavalry are sort of the, sort of the, the brunt, the of, offensive part of, of the Sassanid army. Yeah. Um, but what we see also in the terms of descriptions of the actual Pacifics is that the, the cavalry of uh, the Persians were these iconic styled horse archers as one type of unit and uh, the heavy cataphracts of sort of reminiscent of the Parthian Empire. Yeah. And, and what we see is these descriptions of uh, the cataphracts of, you know, everything uh, in, in clad armour except their eye sockets, you know, very mm. frightening. Mm. So their horses were completely covered in armour. Yeah. And not even, it's not just the person on top of the horse that's now a problem, but if you're an infantryman and this is running at you, you have to deal with the, 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 the man himself, but also this horse that has probably a very vast amount of weight on it, which will yeah. probably kill you as well, you know. So actually they were a very devastating shock type of cavalry. Yeah, so, you know, it was very much the the offensive and the, the arm that dealt the damage for the Persians. Yeah. Um, you know, the infantry was still a core part, but the cavalry were sort of the prime of the Sassanids. You know, it was mm. very much linked into their society that the cavalry were the, were reserved for the nobility because um, it was, you know, the, the activities of the Sassanid um, culture was hunting, mm -hmm. you know, doing uh, uh, racing and stuff. So what we see is a development occurring um, throughout the late 5th and early 6th century for the Persians. And this is um, not necessarily a move um, from a mixed composition, but the, the importance um, is stressed even more so on the cavalry. Um, and this is due to an internal reform by Kuzro. And he, what he does is he's, he understands that the, the cataphracts of the high nobility and the, the lower nobility, which is still nobility, because they can still afford horses, would be the horse archers. Mm -hmm. And what he decides is that, you know, manpower is not dwindling, but it's, you know, it's always going to be the smallest part of his army, is the cavalry. Yes. So what he decides to do is reform the institution. He merges these two nobility groups together, mm -hmm. and he forms the cataphracts and the horse archer together to form the composite cavalry uh, cavalry man. Which is uh, like a bow and spear cavalry type. Yeah, so but bow and lance, occasionally, you know, um, a shield, very rarely. Um, still relatively well armed in terms of armour, mm -hmm. but they do take a lot of the weight off. Yep. So uh, the horse isn't as heavily armoured, um, yeah. and the individual himself isn't... Um, clad head to toe in, yeah. in, in armour. But on the flip side, that then means they're more um, flexible, so they may be quicker at moving, so you know the, the horse archer won't get bogged down while he's shooting and stuff like that. Yeah. But they're also uh, equipped well enough to then go to hand-to-hand -hand combat. So they're like the middle ground for both. Yeah, you, you sort of, it's, it's the combination of light cavalry and heavy cavalry and what you get, a medium yeah. cavalry. <laughs> um, and, and this was done to sort of add mobility to the army. Um, and, and just sort of flesh out its cavalry corps as, as, as well as um, provide internal sort of support between the nobility. And, um, and what we see is, is this is a result of um, warfare changing in the 6th century. The Persians wanted to focus more on warfare with their uh, key enemies, um, which were the Huns. And, and the Huns, as we know, were sort of focused on cavalry warfare. You know, mm. they were these very mobile, very dangerous individuals on horseback. And to sort of combat this um, threat, the Persians needed to develop their own military to sort of reflect the nomadic style. Mm. And this is what we can see in the composite cavalry. Mm. Yeah, because I presume with the um, the way you would imagine these uh, Hunnic people would be hordes of uh, horse archers. And I imagine if you're on a very heavy cataphract running around with all this armor on, you're more than likely not going to be able to catch someone who's very lightly mm. armoured, has a bow and is, you know, running away. So, yeah, I think uh, this, this change to a composite cavalry that you're talking about is probably a necessity. But so how does that then come into the eastern, uh, uh, to the uh, eastern frontier with Byzantium? Yeah, so it, it plays a very interesting dynamic because obviously the Romans still had large amount of infantry. Um, a growing amount of cavalry, you know, they, they see the importance with uh, their previous wars with the Parthians and then the early Sassanid uh, mm. conflicts. 
So you, you, but predominantly the Roman army is still composed of a main line of infantry with cavalry on the sides. Yeah, so the, the, the Battle of Dara is when you can sort of see um, very much a, 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 a traditional Persian force still in, 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 um, in existence. You have sort of the major uh, centre block of infantry mm -hmm. and then the cavalry on either, either flank. Um, and, and to be fair, although they were defeated, it was still... Um, evident that um, a Persian mixed force of infantry, archery, cavalry could still be utilised um, by the Persians. If mm. we then go a year on into the same campaigning uh, um, season. season with mm. uh, Roman Persia, we go to the, we come to the Battle of Corlinicum in 531 AD. And this is when um, Persia um, sent out um, an invasion force that was starting to sort of come back upon the Persian territory due to due to the victory of uh, the Romans at Dara, and what we see is an all cavalry force by the Persians. Oh right! And uh, this not only included the new composite cavalrymen, this also was, uh, included the horse archers as a as another contingent alongside um, allied Arab uh, cavalry, assume, presumably from the Lakhmid allies. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and what is evident in the battle is that although the Romans were trying to improve their cavalry forces, um, it had success in, in the west with uh, typical battles, uh, the Persian cavalry is still um, much better than the Romans. Mm -hmm. So what we see is um, the Romans uh, having an infantry uh, line on the left side and then the cavalry on the right, so the Persians break the right flank of the Romans uh, and wheel around, sort of surround them. And what we see is it that this battle comes down to infantry. Yeah. And this is where we see possibly the disadvantages of the new Persian um, cavalrymen. Because obviously the Roman infantry is still heavy infantry mm -hmm. uh, and they had the backs against uh, the river. Um, what it encompassed was several cycle charges and volleys of uh, archery from the Persians to try and break the Roman infantry. Yeah. And what we see is the ca it became a stalemate. Mm -hmm. um, the cavalry of the Persians couldn't penetrate the Roman lines, um, and so both uh, sides uh, withdrew. Yeah. And what this really shows is that the Persians, to an extent, lost their capability to punch through infantry lines. Mm -hmm. And although this wasn't sort of you know the the prime purpose of cataphracts or even you know heavy uh, cavalry was particularly to punch through the lines, it was still. Um, an aspect that they could take advantage of. Mm. And what we see is the Persians lose this. Um, so they gain an advantage or equal footing with the steppe people, with uh, the Huns, um, and, and the people that they did this reform to sort of target. But what we see is that in their defense and invasions of uh, Roman territory, it sort of to an extent has um, not a negative uh, effect, but it, it, it lessens their capability on the field against the Romans. Mm. Um, and hence why in later campaigns you see various forces of cavalry, um, inv uh, raiding and invasion forces not um, not deciding to have a field battle with the Roman mm. with the armies. They sort of go around, raid, and they quite often call for infantry reinforcements before they even think about having a field battle with Roman infantry. So what we mm. see is this real change in dynamic from field battles mm. to sort of more mobility based, trying to adapt to their new reform within and then use that then on the Romans. Mm. So. But wasn't it also the case that the Romans um, and the Byzantines changed, uh, initially changed their own composition to face this new um, uh, composition cavalry made by the uh, Sassanid Persians because they uh, were in a bit of trouble when fighting these armies to start with because they had a very um, maneuverable and deadly uh, cavalry force. Although, as we see, as you just mentioned, when they're up against infantry, that's where they lacked. But um, I believe that the Romans did make some changes as well, did they not? Yeah, so um, the most obvious change to the cavalry, the Roman infantry uh, retained its importance um, in terms of defensive manoeuvres and on the mm. battlefield as sort of the backbone core of the army. Um, but where we see the development really is in the cavalry of the Romans. Um, mm -hmm. And in the Battle um, of Strasbourg in the 4th century, um, which is uh, 
a German um, Rhine sort of located um, battle. So mm. quite away from the east, um, yeah. and that's and that's due to us not having any records specifically of um, detailed uh, engagements between the Romans and Persians in this century. Mm. It's more just sort of they, they attacked and mm. this happened. Um, but we can assume that the army at the Battle of Strasbourg was probably a typical uh, Eastern Roman army as well. So it yeah. still does apply if you think of it in that way. Yeah, so the troops, would, although they would have been German or German orientated, um, the barbarians or the, the Foderati would have been different, but the, the, the general composition of the army mm. of of the infantry and then the separate cavalry divisions would have been equally the same yeah. as as an eastern force um and what we see in this roman force is that the cavalry much like the persians not due to nobility this time but due to just how the army was um composed mm. was um formed between the heavy cavalry of the sort of the cataphracti and then the equites sagittari which were the roman horse archers mm. And the Battle of Strasbourg just demonstrates that the Roman cavalry wasn't up to scratch, basically, and it was, again, left to the infantry. Mm -hmm. And then what we see throughout um, mainly the 6th century, this development um, becomes apparent, at least. You know, this may be incurring throughout the 5th century, but it becomes very apparent that with the establishment of um, the Bucolari within the text of Procopius, that there's this new form of cavalry that is becoming um, very effective in mm. um, not only Eastern warfare, but Western. And what this Bucolari unit is, it's, it's, it's a series of individuals who are private retainers for an individual. Okay. So they're paid, they're called biscuit eaters, you know, because, <laughs> because, because basically the, the, the owner would pay for their meals and that would be their wage. Oh, um, I've seen like biscuit as in they'd be eating biscuits and that's how they're paid. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> Um, so, but they, they could be from any walk of life. They could be a farmer, they could be a proper soldier, um, but they were a private bodyguard of mm. an individual. And what we see in the 6th century of Belisarius is the, the increasing numbers. So um, the numbers that he takes uh, in, in his campaigns in Persia and his campaigns in the West is about 5,000 men. And when you think of this unit, this wasn't a unit that was typically assigned to the Roman military. Mm. It was his private retainer and um, they became very effective because once again, whether through, through coincidence or pure planning, um, they were a copy of the Persian composite cavalrymen. Mm. So it was this combination of horse archer and heavy cataphract to become this medium cavalry mm. with lance and bow, a bit more lightly armoured so that it was more mobility. Mm. And what we have is um, they're increasingly, uh, they are increasingly used throughout the 6th century. Mm. And when we look at the Strategicon of Morris, which is a late 6th century um, military manual, we see that there's no mention of the Bucolari, but the description that we get given by uh, the manual is that the normal cavalry are very much in the same light as the Bucolari. Their arms the same, they're okay. trained the same. They look the same. Yeah. So what we can sort of see is that this this sort of training ground of Belisarius to sort of pose the idea of a Bucolai becoming a mainstay of, yeah. the, of the army then comes into fruition. And in the later 6th century, although the Bucolari possibly do still remain, the normal cavalry contingents of the Roman army then become mm. more more like the Bucolari and they sort of have this... Adapt, they have adapted to this Persian threat mm. and created this composite cavalryman. Well, that's really interesting. Then, if you think about it, so you have the Sassanid Persians changing their um, their cavalry to deal with the Hunnic White Huns in the north. Um, then the uh, Byzantine Empire look at their cavalry and think, "Wow, actually, we should really change our cavalry to be able to defeat these." So then they copy the Sassanids, uh, Sassanids, and. Um, and then uh, this small contingent, which is the Bucolari, becomes the normal cavalry for the army. Well, that's actually quite interesting because you can kind of see then where everyone's looking. Uh, the Byzantines are obviously worried about the Sassanids, so they change to, um, to deal with them. But the Sassanids aren't looking at the Byzantines and thinking, how do we make our cavalry better against them? They've looked at the Hunnic people and thought, how do we stop them? So that, that's really interesting. Maybe that does give an, us an insight of who they actually believe was the threat to, to themselves. And maybe, you know, this is a really good piece of evidence that show that um, the, um, 
the Sassanids were more worried about the White Huns and not the Byzantines. Yeah, very much so. It was very much a case of the Sassanids putting their more uh, severe threat at the top and then just saying, basically, we'll try and make the best of this situation against the Roman mm. armies. And then the Roman armies, like you said, thinking, oh, we, we can't deal with this Sassanid threat. We need to develop our armies once again um, and adapting like they do. And then they, they come up with this, this not copycat, but it's, mm. it's very much this obvious, similar, similar yeah. type of unit. Um, yeah. So on these changes, back to the uh, kind of Bukhari becoming the main cavalry that uh, we uh, were talking about. So what I can see is that it's clear that these cavalry units started to become the more offensive unit for the Roman army. Mm -hmm. And um, normally, when you think of the Roman army, you think traditionally it would be the infantry corps side that would engage early into a battle. Well, now it kind of flipped, and it was sort of the cavalry, which were the more dominant fighting sections, uh, of the army and it's the infantry that would hold back the infantry of course they still serve a purpose and different scenarios they're very useful such as the one you gave earlier where the uh, I can't remember the name of the battle but the infantry uh, line was had their backs against the river and the uh, Persians could not break through because they didn't have that sort of shock heavy cavalry um, so they obviously still serve the purpose but um, it's sort of that idea that uh, the the cavalry really are now that bl that final blowing force that will be able to destroy an army. A bit like if you imagine a boxer, you know, your um your infantry are are your body and your head that keeps getting hit, but your cavalry are your hands. They're the ones that can give you that final blow and make that decisive action. So it's very clear to see that um, the Sassanids had a massive impact on how the Byzantines changed their units and their roster, but also how they then enacted in a battle. And obviously their tactics on the battle have changed. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So with all this in mind, let's, let's start to pose the, the question of the podcast. So was, were they natural rivals? The uh, Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Persians. So what do you feel? Do you feel like they are? And is there any reasons why? Or do you think they're not? And there's other things in play? Um, I, th I think they probably are natural rivals. Um, just down to the factors of geography. They're located pretty much against each other in terms of their frontier. Mm. Um, the, the, it's been um, a place of conflict for much of the latter part of the Roman Empire, even, to be honest, even during the Roman Republic, you had the War of Parthia. Um, it's where the Romans decided that it would be, uh, during the Republic and Empire times, where to expand. That was their next expansion zone. Mm -hmm. um, so geographically, they're located very close to each other. They they had to have interacted in some, in some extent. And then you, you sort of look at the other factors, such as religion. You know, this was a Christian empire. Mm and you had a Zoroastrian empire right next to you. So mm -hmm. although they might have um, been certain, uh, there might have been certain periods of peace, if we look, jump forward to like the Crusades, we can see that religion played such an important part of why people went to war. Mm -hmm. And this is no different in, in the Roman and Persian era. You know, the, um, the religions of both empires were serious matters. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was another factor, and then diplomatically, you know, the, again, using the geography, they were they were close together. You know, they were either enemies, or they were allies of convenience. You know, they 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 interacted with with each other on certain different levels that is sort of um, that can't be sort of understood so clearly because you had like we see the hierarchy, the emperor reacting to the shah mm. and shah. You know, you had the armies engaging with one another, but you also had the cultural integration emerging between the frontiers, yeah. like the everyday people living it. Yes. Um, certain places would have been out of bounds, certain places would have been dead man's land, you know. Mm. And, and it's that sort of environment that you do think, okay, maybe these two people aren't going to get along. So in terms of that, I would say they are rivals purely because... Um, mostly geography and the nature of imperial empires you know Rome was an imperial empire and yeah and the, the Sasanians weren't imperial 
empire too. So it was just the nature of yeah. the institutions that brought them together to an extent. I think that's something we have we actually haven't really touched on much is that idea of um, their heritage. So they would be very used to the idea that they are enemies. You had the Achaemenid Persians versus the um, the Greek polis states that you uh, came together during the Persian Wars. You had the Parthians against the um, Roman Empire when it was uh, one big solid empire. And now you've got the Sassanid Persians against the Byzantines. So for many, many centuries, this war or this conflict of East versus West has been going on. And so how much a factor does that play into power? I would probably argue that's probably quite a large thing. It's like the... Um, if you think of Brit uh, uh, England and France with their Hundred Years' mm. War, it was sort of solidified that this war would continue because it's what had already ha always happened. They are natural rivals. And you can see even to modern day in football matches, rugby matches, whoever, uh, when France and uh, England play each other, there's a bit more rivalry because mm. of all this history. So I reckon this heritage of, this, uh, of these wars probably played a big factor into it. And they probably themselves thought of them as rivals because of this, even mm. though potentially the bigger threats were elsewhere. You know? yeah. But then that is that is an, a reason maybe they weren't, you know, because it was quite one-sided, this border. Rome was very defensive, very worried about it, putting a lot of manpower there, a lot of garrisons. And the Persians, on the other hand, yes, they did have centres of administration. They had the two cities very heavily uh, fortified there. But they had a quite naturally... Uh, a natural boundary with uh, mountains and rivers to prevent it and they weren't guarded as much as the Romans they were more worried about their northern borders so you know potentially potentially maybe the state didn't think they were rivals but the people did it's quite yeah. a complex thing so yeah. if you had to give an overall of were they rivals were they not what would you uh, what would you stand on I would say when when looking at sort of the general narratives of, of military conquest, power and war, you would definitely say that they were rivals. They um, constant conflict with one another, whether it was religion, over conflict, over land, territory, um, whether he was going to be king, in the case of Morris and Kuzro and others. Um, but like you said, it was very one-sided. When you look at the sort of the nitty-gritty and the treaties and the actual evidence, you do see that maybe Rome uh, viewed Persia as a rival. And mm. um, to an extent, I think Persia did view Rome as a rival, but a lesser rival. Yeah. Um, still equal in terms of maybe their power, you know, Shah and Shah Emperor. I think they, they took into consideration that they yeah. were equals on that level. Um, but I do think the Sassanids did think that they were perhaps a little bit better than the Romans mm. at, uh, quite on quite a few occasions. Mm. Um, and then when you look at it even deeper with the cultural and the people on the ground, mm. I think there was definitely a rift between the two. Um, although when you look at sort of the Crusades and, you know, the, the Christians and Turks, you would see that they would be integrated in local communities. And I think that there is a sign that there was, to an extent, some integration. Mm. But then there was definitely a case of where the two nations were split on a border. There was yeah. a clear border, a clear frontier. Um, and that was kept throughout most of their, their time together, which mm. just demonstrates that neither one of them was willing to budge for the other. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd have to largely agree, yes. Yeah. I think they were rivals. I think to an extent they were actually natural rivals as well. Um, but I don't think that they were each other's biggest threat. I think maybe for the Byzantines that the Sa Sassanids were their biggest threat. But I don't think the Sassanids considered the Byzantines as their biggest threat. But they were their natural rivals that sort of they felt obliged to go to war with them because it's what had happened before. It's what made sense for them. They could get a lot of money from this and then worry about the bigger people outside, which would be the White Huns and the uh, Balkan areas where they had lots of nomadic tribes that were a problem. Yeah. I, would, I would just add, though, that this is... I would say this is very much the sort of the fourth to the end of the sixth century. I think when we yeah. sort of hit the seventh century, in particular to Heraclius, it was very much... Um, as, as James Howard Johnston would prefer, these were the last two great powers of late antiquity. Mm. You know, this was the war, the last war of Heraclius and the Persians was the last showdown. Yeah. This was who was going to make it, who was going to survive, who was going to win. And in terms of that conflict, I would definitely say that they were 
bitter rivals to the yeah. end. It was it was um, a conflict of two two memories, and only mm. one would last in the yeah. pages of history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sean Strong for coming on to this podcast today. He came a long way to come on, so I'm very thankful for him, and I think he's put in some really interesting thoughts to get your minds going and also ours. We had to pick our brains a bit for this one. (laughs) But um, as always, if you found this podcast interesting, we would really recommend some reading. So I'm going to say an ancient source, and then uh, Sean is going to put in some modern scholarship. So... I would really recommend you go and read Procopius, uh, and his work is called The Wars, and it covers the first Persian war uh, between the Byzantines and the Sassanids, and then it also talks about Justinian's reconquest of the West, the Western Roman Empire that had already fallen, and so he goes and fights the Vandals and the Goths and stuff like that. And then he also then touches upon the second Persian conflict. Uh, so if you're interested in this and want to see an ancient history, uh, ancient uh, perspective on it, go read this. Uh, Sean's going to put in some modern scholarship, though, if any of you would like to go and read that. Yeah, so I think perhaps the best sort of understanding of uh, the Roman-Persian War um, in its sort of height, which you could say, um, I would uh, suggest um, Geoffrey Greatrex, which is Rome and Persia at War, which is uh, 502 to 532. Um, which covers the Anastasius War and the first uh, war of um, Justinian with the Persians. And this just gives a good overview of sort of the dynamics of the Persian and Roman War. Of course, this is just focusing on the two wars. Um, So if you wanted to do further reading, then um, there are other books available which um, do that plenty. But this sort of gives a solid foundation of the armies, the numbers, the narrative of the first wars, which gives a good give a good basis of knowledge for further reading so thank you very much for listening to this episode of the podcast stay tuned for more our next podcast is going to be on the peloponnesian war where the great cities of athens and sparta face again thank you very much for listening and i'll see you next time